everybody, and thank you for joining me today. It's Alan Barry Labucan here with the Rocks and Stocks News website. I've got a couple of great guests in Joel Senek and Ken McNaughton. Um, their names might not sound familiar, but their former company will uh, to viewers that have been watching my show for a long time. Pretium uh, Resources was a huge winner, picked it early. Recently, they went through a takeover. And now it looks like uh, Joe and Ken are at it again. They were instrumental in finding and building a mine at Pretium. And now they've got P2 Gold. Ken and Joe, thank you for joining me. Great, great, great to be thank here, you, Alan. So we did a show not too long ago, not long after they had a couple news releases out from their GABS project. Uh, 2.3 meet uh, grams of gold equivalent over 48 meters. Another one, one gram over 153 meters. And then they announced the big financing. So I wanted to get the gentleman on today to, to talk to us about that new financing and the plans going forward. So go ahead, uh, Joe. Okay, I'll just jump in on the financing side. So what we've done is we've, we've essentially been raising flow through in this financing so we can fund the exploration at BAM this coming season up in the Golden Triangle. So we're fully funded now. Uh, we've closed, the financing closes this coming week. However, we've closed off uh, subscriptions. We've oversubscribed. We've got a, we're going to have about $5 million set aside just for our BAM program up north. Uh, and Ken will talk to you about, I guess you'll have some questions about that, but you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, a nice size drill program to really expand on BAM with that financing. Plus, uh, was there some hard dollars so yeah. you can do some money uh, exploration down at GABS? Yeah, we, we're, we're bringing in about a million of hard dollars as well. That's fully funded now, uh, that, that, that portion of the financing as well. And that allows us to get the drill going again at GABS. Uh, the question there always is finding a drill in New Bata, but uh, we're hoping to get going uh, early spring, maybe late winter. So March-ish, uh, February, March, if we can get things lined up. So Joe, does that sound like the, the next order of business with drilling um, would be GABS and then uh, BAM? Yeah, I'll, I'll let Ken speak to, to the drill programs. He's yeah. running them. Yeah, just with the, the weather and everything, it, it actually fits nicely. We've got a contractor we're using up here and he's uh, got his license to, um, uh, to operate in Nevada. So uh, we're just, I just sent the email off before we got on to see when he'd have his drill ready. Um, so get in with the diamond drill again, clean up some of the geology, and then, uh, and then we'd move into an RC program, uh, shut those down, get assays, move the crews up to BAM, uh, do our work up there, eight to 10,000 meters of diamond drilling, uh, geophysics, and then, um, then we'll have our assays back from GABS and we move the crews back down. So it's a nice complementary uh, movement to maintain people uh, and work on two projects. So, uh, Ken, let's start with GABS then. Um, give us an overview of the, the geological story, what you've found so far, and then where, where to from here. Uh, what's got you guys excited about that project? Well, the, the, the story at GABS is really twofold. There's the historical work that we've come in, we've confirmed uh, everything they drilled in the past is there. And, and as we believed, we, we, we think the grades are higher. And, and the rationale for that is uh, they used a lot of percussion drilling in the 70s and 80s or 80s and 90s, um, which is basically just a blast hole rig. So they don't actually control the cutting. So there's a lot of losses. They also drilled sub-vertical holes or vertical holes in a system that seems to have a bit of a, a sub-vertical stock work. The gold is, is related to a stock work, a kind of a Walker Lane system, because we're in Walker Lane. Um, and the copper seems to be more ubiquitous. It doesn't seem to matter the orientation of the hole. So by us drilling angle holes, um, we confirm that the system's thicker uh, and higher grade, 
but we and we think the higher grades is in part due to this subvertical stock work, and we could see that in our vertical holes versus our angle holes. And now tell us a little bit about that system. Um, I remember looking at some maps, and there was some quite good distribution throughout the uh, drill holes, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's right. So basically, we come down through a, a cap rock, and there, there's likely a, a, a shear at the top of the system. So the cap rock is dead. And then as soon as we get below that shear, we start picking up mineralization, and, and then we get high grades concentrated within these monzonite sills. And in the andesites and that immediately below the, the sill. So we get very, those are those high grade uh, intervals that we get. And then the gold tends to drop off quicker and the copper then continues for quite a bit below the, the sill. So very typical of an alkaline porphyry, which is what we believe this is part of. Um, the, the gold and copper come in as separate systems. They're closely timed, but they're distinct events. Now, do you think that this is a, like, I mean, that's some pretty great uh, distribution of gold that um, I, I'm looking at GBD 01, 9, and 8. Uh, 8 seemed to have the best and longest distribution, which was your, your deepest, but the dots are connecting nicely on 01 and 09. Uh, do you think that this is like the, the extension off of a porphyry or what, what, what's your view so far? Well, there, there's a couple of theories. These are either thrust wedges. So it's, it's the porphyry system's been sheared and, and like a deck of cards because there's a lot of extension in, in uh, Nevada, particularly that area. So that's one theory. Uh, the other theory is that these are sills coming up off of a big alkaline porphyry system. And, and we know from the Newcrest work in the 2000s, they found an area between Sullivan and, and uh, Lucky Strike where they were fairly uh, convinced that the source porphyry was. And we've since run some MT there and our, have a second follow-up program. So we believe in that area as well. So um, these are related to a bigger alkaline porphyry at depth. We're not certain the exact relationship of it right now. And so that geophysical survey, does that give you deeper penetration so that you might be able to see a porphyry if there's one there? Yeah, for sure. We're looking down a couple kilometers. And uh, uh, based on, uh, was there any chemical signatures that, you know, can help you uh, believe that model? Well, you know, you've got to put all the pieces to the puzzle together. So we've got a very good historic ground magnetic survey that Newcrest did, plus their IP survey. Um, we've done a, a lot of prospecting. Uh, we ran the hyperspectral survey. And everything, there, there was no, you know, big red bullseye in any of these. But when you start stacking things up together, it all starts to make sense. And, and one thing we've learned from our prospecting, uh, particularly over Lucky Strike, uh, there are a ton of showings that were, I'm sure they were sampled in the past, but they weren't in any of the historical work that we received when we bought the project. But it's very clear that while these showings in themselves don't amount to anything, what they were telling us was Lucky Strike was down there, but we had to get down 100 meters into the favorable rock. Now, as we move away from Lucky Strike, where there's very little drilling, particularly between Lucky Strike and Carbody, there is a ton of showings there. And if we take that analogy, while these showings are great in this amongst themselves, they won't necessarily produce any tonnage, but they're telling us there's a big system sitting around in that area. So we've got near surface potential to look at. We've also got these bigger, uh, the bigger system at depth, which, you know, we're just, it's just a geophysics target at this point. Well, and the, the distribution of the gold uh, in the drill holes has to suggest that there's something deep, uh, bigger, deeper. 
Yeah, absolutely. This this is a big system. There's no question about it. And so far, is most of that gold distribution has that been in the oxides, or are you transitioning into sulfides? There's no difference between oxides and sulfides. We we don't. There's not a super gene zone with this. It's a very low sulfur system, so it it's really in the monzonites, and then sometimes when the monzonites get thin, well, which they do off to the southeast, then we see the high-grade gold extending down into the proxenites and the andesites. But for the most part, and, and we still don't understand completely, and you know, in part it's Walker Lane, so it's, you know, they don't always behave nicely or, or, or you know, show themselves well, but um, no, the, the to answer your question, the gold distribution is pretty consistent as we come from oxide into sulfide. Excellent, excellent. So next season when you start drilling again, uh, is it just a matter of walking it down deeper? Is that how you're going to drill it or where do you? Sure, we're starting from the known and we're working out from there. So we've got 70 million tons that we need to drill off properly. To, to establish a 43101 resource. And we think we're gonna get an uptick there just because of the, the uptick in grade, the, the increased thickness, and then a better geologic model constraining things properly, uh, as well as applying proper specific gravities to all the different units. So, so we've got lots of upside with the known, and then, then we start stepping out and following the trends and firing some deep holes then at these, these deeper geophysics targets as well. Now, yeah. with, with the kind of distribution that you have, you probably won't have to dr drill super tight spacing to get a resource, is that correct? Uh, certainly not on an inferred basis. We could do 100 by 100. Wow. And then, and then we'll have to, you know, arm wrestle with the person doing the, the uh, resource, whether, whether we have to take that tighter for um, uh, indicated and measured. I, I would argue against it, but you know, you, you always, I always argue against the trap, but <laughs> uh, however, um, you always have to do these resources thinking somebody's gonna audit you. And so, you know, there's some standard things we'll have to deal with. Well, it's certainly not like you had to go through at Predium where you had to drill super tight holes. I mean, 100 meters is quite nice if you can get away with that. Yeah, I would hope so. Uh, but yeah, you know, 50, for sure, 50 by 50 meters will get us indicated and probably measured. But yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, we're going to start at 100 meter spacing and, and then see what the stats say. Perfect. Okay, so let's now talk about BAM. Um, and when, uh, when there's a couple of really nice geochem anomalies that uh, you show in your pro presentation, but um, again, there um, you had very, very near surface, very nice gold distribution, especially at the contacts of two rock packages. And it doesn't, and, and it doesn't look like you've drilled into that favorable rock unit, you have a parallel one going to that. Um, am I getting a good read on that, uh, Ken? Well, you know, we, we had to do a hurry up offense last year. We had a drill booked and given the availability of drills, it wasn't a matter of, well, we'll delay them and go when we go. We had a specific calendar window to work with. So um, we had geochem, we were doing mapping, it was a late spring. And so we basically drilled the geochem anomalies. But the, from our standpoint, the best thing is we drilled four holes into that gold zone and every one of them hit good mineralization, and including hole three, which hit you know an open pit and underground grade intersection. So um, the, the project has performed well above anything we expected. And, and we've learned a lot from that and we've done subsequent work. So we're gonna come back with a focus program this year. But, and, and as you say, we'll be drilling through 
and, yeah. and into that mineralization on that you're talking about in hole three. Because there's a, a green unit and a blue, light yeah. blue unit. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And so the, the, light, the light blue is, is carbonates, which are all now dolomites and, and, and iron stone. So, you know, siderite, anchorite alteration. And then the, the green that all of unit is the, uh, the, um, the SEDs, which have been, uh, that's all been horn felt by the older intrusive. And you're even getting it in that blue unit of rock. You, 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 uh, the copper zones down there, it's pretty barren of gold. There's the odd little kick in it, but for the most part, the dolomites are, are dead for gold, but the copper, um, the copper system from the Jan, Jan copper that blasted up through the, uh, the dolomites. Would have been nice to get another couple hundred meters on that BAM 03, eh? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah, uh, <laughs> is it ever? Now, Joe, um, when we talked last, you uh, mentioned just the great infrastructure, and in that you know, even though it's up in the Golden Triangle, it's in quite a quite an excellent location. Why don't you expand on that a little for the audience? Sure, Alan. Thanks. Um, so uh, the nice thing about BAM, it, though it's in the triangle, and when we were at Bruce Jack, we had to build a 75 kilometer road. We had to build a 57 kilometer long transmission line, uh, all helicopter supported. The nice thing about BAM is we're sitting just off the Galore Creek Road. So that's the big Newmont Tech joint venture, big alkaline porphyry system. And they've pushed their road. Uh, I can't remember the price tag, it's, it's big, but their road is actually pushed right up within a two kilometers of our property boundary. So for us to, uh, to drive a road up onto the land is, is, is nothing compared to what we had to do at Bruce Jack. So nice, nice, uh, nice and close infrastructure on transport. And then the Northwest transmission line, which runs uh, up north beside uh, Highway 37, it is under 40 kilometers by road, about 30, 35 kilometers by road. And so the nice thing of having the transmission line by the road is, you can build it alongside the road because uh, uh, there's nothing that drives up costs more, whether it's uh, exploration or construction, it is helicopter time. It, it just costs a fortune. And, you know, we were using these big, big sky cranes. That's I can't remember what they were, 10,000 bucks an hour or whatever it was. Oh. It was more than that, 20,000. It was ridiculous. It, yeah. So, uh, no, nah, that's the nice thing, having, uh, having a road and transmission line close by. You also mentioned in our last conversation that the topography is quite nice as well. Yeah, where where we where we've got the deposit, the nice thing it's a nice it's a nice bench. So we get up off the road, we have to climb up a bit to get to it. But once we're there, uh, geez, I don't know what is it. It's probably eight, seven, eight kilometers north south, and yeah, four kilometers east west, yeah. four or five kilometers. So it's that's a, a big, nice it's a nice big, big bench, yeah. and so you're not. You don't have to cross a glacier to get to it. It's not, you know, one of these things where we're building a mine on top of a mountain. It's, it's, it's just a nice flat piece of ground. It's incredible. It's, it's, it, you couldn't ask for better up in the triangle to build a mine. So from a strategic point of view of drilling something like that, you don't have to have got, uh, rigs hanging off the sides of mountains and, and you can uh, more easily access uh, the favorable rock units. Absolutely, it's you, you see some of those drill platforms where they're, you know, built off the side of a, a mountain. No, that's ours. Or there's hardly anything. They're nice, easy platforms to put in. Yeah. And uh, you know, once we can get some equipment in there, uh, you know, we'll get this summer's program done. But after that, we can get some equipment in. Then you know, you're moving your drills with equipment because you're not trying to hang them off the side of a hill. So that should make it much easier for you guys to get some serious drilling done there now that you got the cash in the bank and you can start making some plans. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We we're cashed up for this year's program. And as Ken mentioned, eight to 10,000 meters. And that's to start, uh, you know, just as an example with, with Bruce Jack, we went in there and we did, uh, I think the first season drilling there was about 20,000 meters. Just under, yeah. yeah, and then we came back, I think the next year was 75 and then 100. So 
you can ramp up quickly once you get the ability to get some equipment in and, and help you out with uh, moving your drills around so you're not completely helicopter dependent. So you guys shouldn't have to use helicopters too much, just basically set up and then maybe safety or? Well, this year we'll need them, but uh, yeah, the thought is uh, get, you know, use them this year and then for uh, 23, yeah, pull back on the amount of helicopter time, which will really, uh, you know, let us spend more of our money going into the ground and less flying it around. Isn't that going to be nice? Yeah, absolutely. Well. Um... Ken, I really like picking your brain because, you know, you've already found a super high grade uh, mine and it uh, kicked off a lot of high grade gold and very low cost. Um, but it, it, this, uh, this, BAM, this BAM looks quite, quite exceptional. And it looks like you have the markers there to, to really roll up your sleeves. Yeah, for sure. So you know, what we don't publish is a lot of the chemistry, the tellurium and things like that are really telling us that we're in a, in a, uh, an epithermal system. And, you know, what, what we think's come along, it's actually going to be a pretty simple model. And we've got a, a slide of that in the presentation, but, you know, basically you've got these old sediments and then a very old intrusive and then that the structure that intrusive came up was re reactivated and a Galore Creek age uh, system came up and that's what's driving this epithermal system. So the older, the older intrusive cooked all the rocks, it made the sediments more brittle, it made the, the uh, dolomites, it converted them, well, the limestones converted them to dolomite and and this uh, siderite anchorite. So now they're more resistive and it's just a, a perfect combination of then this epithermal system or this uh, 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 porphyry system coming up and then finding the path of least resistance, which was the fractured seds along the contact for the gold. And then the copper system had more power to it. So it's just a phreatic breccia and it just blasted through everything. So not only do we have great infrastructure, but we've got a pretty simple exploration model and we're gonna develop this very quickly. So find the trends for the near surface mineralization and then come back to that source structure and just start following it to depth. And you know we should be pumping holes into a porphyry system this year. I'm very confident we're gonna do that. Well, there's, that's two great parts to that story. Uh, I'm down here in Zacatecas, Mexico, and I live not far from the uh, Mag Silvers uh, Juan Escipio. Yeah. Um, and uh, not far from Juan Escipio, you have a cluster of epithermal veins um, at Fresnillo. This whole district is full of epithermal veins. Um, and there's some, some very nice things that come out of that. One is high grade. The second is that you can you can find a lot of these veins. Some of them won't even come to surface. Um, you know, they're blind veins like Juan Escipio. Uh, and then um, you've got the, um, you. it looks like you've got the right preparation of the rock to, to find multiple veins as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I'm like Juan Escipio, which I tried to buy for Silver Standard, by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I had a little thing at Pitaria that I had to work on first, so Bob wouldn't let us. Um, but we've got a 10 million year plateau basalt. So you've got the rhyolites down there that cap everything. And we have this plateau basalt. It's only 10 million years old, but that actually fills the contact between the sediments and this older intrusive and where this big regional structure is coming in. So it's only 10, 20 meters thick, but that's, you can see everything trending over towards that. And then we know there has to be the contact down there. So, so the cover is not that thick. 10 to 20 meters. And with that cover, it would suggest the potential to find blind veins as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's all kinds of potential down below that. 
because I was mentioning to uh, uh, Joe, or Joe last time we spoke that not far from me here in Zacatecas is the Milagros mine. And uh, two veins came to surface and they mined that. And then they were doing a cross cut and they found a blind vein that in today's dollar value would be worth like $300,000 a ton. So in these clusters of FP thermal veins, you can often find these blind veins that are very rich. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we know we're heading back towards the, the hot spot, the heat of the system. So what we're seeing on surface is very much the fringes of the system. And as we move back and move and, and start drilling below that basalt, we're, we should see things improve greatly. Well, and that, that gets very exciting because then you're talking about the heat engine that plowed this all into there and, um, and you've got the copper and gold rich porphyry potential. That's correct. Yeah, we've got two big, all well, same system, but two big targets. And do you have some deep penetrating geophysics that will help you or do you follow the veins and just keep going? A little of both. I love the drill. Uh, the drill gives you the best information, but we are in fact going to run a ZTEM uh, survey in uh, late May, June. So that's an airborne MT system. And that should give us a couple of kilometers of penetration. So that's going to show us uh, mostly lithologies, but if there's any big conductors down there, we're going to see them as well. Awesome. I think you guys are on to some great stuff. Before we close, Joe, um, wanted to talk a little bit about gold and copper with you. Um, you know, copper is a pretty simple story. The electrification of vehicles and the need for copper. Um, but in the gold industry, I, I, well, I think both copper and gold have suffered from not enough um, exploration and discoveries and building of mines. But sort of confirmation of that is, and it gets me pretty excited, is this consolidation that's happening. Um, we saw that in the early part of the 2001 to 2011 gold uh, bull market. Uh, are you seeing similar things as me, Joe? Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, there was a lot of, well, there was no money for grassroots exploration, right, for a number of years now. And so there's just no supply you've got the majors they keep burning through their reserves they need to refill them and uh, a lot of their production profiles will be dropping off uh, I, i'm pretty sure newcrest barrack these guys their profiles will be dropping off and they need to fill them somehow and uh, i i think one thing it people are pretty i think it's fairly common to say uh, the majors aren't good at exploration uh, they, they just don't seem to have a lot of success with it. They're good around the mine site, but grassroots exploration wise, uh, the majors are, haven't been successful and you really need the juniors to go out and find, find these projects and, and advance them. You made a really good point there, Joe. I mean, you guys are kind of rock stars, you know, having found and built uh, I know it's uh, you guys are humble, but uh, I can <laughs> I could say it. Um, and even you guys had struggles early on. Uh, you both had to cut some big checks to, and so that I mean, you guys having a hard time is kind of an indicator of just how challenging it has been for explorers to get money. Absolutely, when we were picking up gabs. We love the project. We see all this potential. We talk to people about the potential, and they all like the potential. But no. we had we had to buck up. Yeah. So, but uh, fortunately, we were in a position where we could and get uh, the vendor would, was willing to work with us. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's uh, we're we're pleased that we could get Gabs in the fold, and uh, we're really excited about BAM as well. So having two projects like that within one company, I, I think is phenomenal. It. it it's not often that you see that. So on the supply side, it looks like things are tight. Then you look at the monetary side, money printing worldwide is out of control, debt's out of control, and now inflation is getting pretty powerful worldwide. Um, so 
things are setting up nicely for us in the gold business, wouldn't you say, Joe? Yes, absolutely. And did you see the price of gold today? Nice, nice pop in the price of gold this morning with uh, with people can just see the inflation and they're getting scared. And uh, yeah, gold's going to perform well. Well, I think that was partially because the Fed is starting to, you can start to see the sweat on their forehead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, very true. I, I, absolutely. That's what's driving it. You know, first they said it's transitory, then they said it's frustrating, uh, and it just looks like they can't do anything to stop it. With so much debt out there, if you raised interest rates a point or two, um, you know, that puts a lot of pressure on the governments and the consumers. Yes, and, and the last thing the governments want is uh, pressure on the consumers. It doesn't, doesn't help with the re-election, so... Uh, we don't see interest rates going up a lot that the economy can just can't take it. And so gold's going to run for quite a while. And as you mentioned earlier, copper's got just, just, uh, it's got a nice, you know, nice horizon ahead of it here uh, as we electrify. Yeah. yeah, it sure looks like you got, we've got a nice runway for gold and copper and you guys are on to a, a couple of very exciting projects and, you're not just a couple guys who just fell off the turnip truck. You, you've done it before. <laughs> well, we appreciate that. Yeah. But yeah, we've got a bit of gray hair. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, guys. You've been very generous with your time. I'm going to close things off. If you want to listen in, we can have a little brief chat afterwards. How's that? Great. Sounds good. So there you go, folks. Um, P2 Gold, I love the name. I think it's a play on the Predium. Uh, success and now they're looking for a P Predium 2, P2 Gold's their name. Uh, really talented guys involved with finding gold and copper and also building mines. Uh, they're, they've got their hands on a couple of great projects. Even one is re somewhat remote compared to beautiful Nevada, um, but um, it, it looks like they've got good infrastructure surrounding it. And then you take a look at their valuation. They only have 62 million shares out. I didn't ask the guys, you know, what the insider holding is, but it sounds like there's a good percentage of that held by the insiders. And they only have a $39 million valuation. These are all the, box that, the boxes that I tick off when I'm looking for a, an undervalued story. Uh, the, uh, the other thing is catalysts. Um, you know, you can have a nice looking stock chart and all that, but you have to have the catalyst to make a better valuation. And they have a, a, a lineup of uh, catalysts coming into 2022. <laughs> Got to get my years right here. Um, so as I always say, my shows are for information purposes only. Speak with your advisors and do your homework. And I think as you roll up your sleeves and do your homework, you're gonna find a company here that has a lot of blue sky potential ahead of it. So on that note, have a great day and we'll talk to you soon.